For as long as I can remember, I've understood that the road to achievement in life begins and ends with education. Advancing to the next level always seemed the obvious course for us, my sister, my brother, and me. Both of our parents went to college, both hold advanced degrees, and their parents were schooled at a time when a quality education was something blacks had to fight for. This story is about one of those fights, a struggle endured by my own father and his family, one small family's fight for equality. This documentary is about the first effort to integrate a public school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now what a lot of people in Raleigh are probably familiar with is the story of young William Campbell when he was accepted to Murphy Elementary in 1960. Well, he was the first to go, but he wasn't the first to try. A lot of people may not know or remember who was the first, but there are a few out there who thought no one would ever forget. They'll remember that from now on to the end of time, as long as they live. That Murphy School thing is just something, that's just some, uh, another thing that happened. This is the initial thing that happened. This is the thing that set the whole world on fire, set this part of the world on fire down here, set North Carolina on fire. Joe Holt, Lord have mercy on him and seen you. Well, you know Joe Holt, you know he was the first one to go to Broughton. I never said that to anybody. We, I was never accepted to go to Broughton. Never accepted. It is this paradox which both permeates and justifies the significance of this story. According to many published histories on North Carolina and on Raleigh, my family's story is just an obscure incident. It's hardly ever mentioned. But to the people who witnessed their struggle, theirs is a story of triumph, and people remember it and they talk about it. That's why this documentary is special, not just because it's about my family, but because of who its heroes represent and the battles those heroes fought. This story is a tribute to unsung heroes and the difficult but steady steps which paved a way for greater strides to follow. May 17, 1954 was to change the face of education in America. This was the day the United States Supreme Court ruled in the Brown versus the Board of Education case. In a landmark decision, the court affirmed that separate but equal schools were unconstitutional and inherently unequal. To most blacks in America, this news meant access to a whole new world of opportunity. And this was the case for my father's family in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, at first, I thought it would be all right that the school, the, the black people in Raleigh would have a chance to go to school, to the closest school to buy their, wherever they live. I didn't think it would be any problem at all. I didn't think it would be, because the law had said so. Like Americans all across the nation, North Carolinians were divided on this issue. The president of Bennett College used his influence as a member of the Greensboro School Board. The day following the Supreme Court's decision, Greensboro passed a resolution to move forward on integration. Dr. David Jones' involvement with the North Carolina Teachers Association put him in touch with black educators and leaders from Raleigh, like Dr. Carl Devon. We were ready to face whatever the future would bring. And I was on a group that met with uh, the mayor, uh, telling him to see if he could use his influence with the school boards and all to make this thing smooth. And uh, he said, well, says, the opinion of the court was just a declaration. They didn't say that we have to integrate. So they just started killing for time, killing for time, killing for time. None of this mattered to the black parents in Oberlin. Oberlin is a small, quiet community located in West Raleigh. These parents knew segregation was no longer the law, yet their children had to catch the city bus to travel across town and attend an all-Negro school, J.W. Ligon High School. There was another school located right there in their own neighborhood, not far from their homes, just a short walk away. But it was attended by whites only. These parents asked how they might have their children reassigned to this school, Josephus Daniels Junior High School. Two of those parents were Joseph and Elwina Holt, 
and their son, Little Joe, is my father. My mother went down to, to have an interview with Mr. Jesse O. Sanderson uh, to, uh, to let him know that uh, we wanted to transfer to Josephus Daniels School, okay, jo Josephus Daniels Junior High School on Oakland Road, and we lived on Oakland Road, as opposed to my going three miles across town to Ligon High School, uh, which was the black high school in Raleigh. And uh, Mr. Sanderson uh, uh, really indicated uh, that uh, this was not the time for that, despite the Supreme Court's decision, and endeavored to have my mother uh, arrive at a compromise with him. Uh, he offered to provide a free school bus transportation to the black students who lived in West Raleigh uh, to alleviate uh, their having to catch the bus and ride three miles across town to Ligon High School. Jesse Sanderson advised all of the parents to withdraw their requests and sign an agreement to this compromise. One parent, afraid of losing her job as a school teacher, withdrew her request. My grandfather said he'd take the issue up in court if necessary to find satisfaction. The families waited for a response while the first days of school drew nearer. Finally, Sanderson told them that their applications were too late and had missed a deadline to apply. Meanwhile, he arranged for all the black children in Oberlin to ride the bus to Ligon for free. He never told the school board about the applications, and he never gained official approval for the transportation. News that these black families had applied did not hit the Raleigh papers until November. Within three days, the school board approved the transportation officially. Offering transportation really didn't satisfy us. It didn't satisfy us because the idea was to go to this school right down the street here that you're still telling me I can't go to and you're still making me feel that I'm unacceptable and that I'm not supposed to go there and that I'm not entitled to have a facility that's nice here that I can go to. Yes, Lincoln was nice, but it was cross town and also you still carry it with you as long as you were going to Lincoln High School, that school is for you, this school is for our white kids. You can't go here because whites only can go there. That places upon you uh, it causes a certain amount of psychological damage when you are told you can't go here and others can. We were trying to finally step outside of that, and the law now said we could. The very basis of our individual rights and freedoms rests upon the certainty that the president and the executive branch of government will support and ensure the carrying out of the decisions of the federal courts, even when necessary, with all the means at the president's command. If resistance to the federal court order ceases at once, the further presence of federal troops will be unnecessary, and the city of Little Rock will return to its Norman, normal habits of peace and order, and a blot upon the fair name and high honor of our nation in the world will be removed. My grandparents' decision not to back down carried over to the next year, 1957. My father was promoted to the 10th grade, and he was no longer eligible to attend Daniels since Daniels was a junior high school. But there was still a high school closer to their home than Ligon, again, an all-white school. Needham Broughton High School was, and still is, one of the largest and most highly regarded high schools in Raleigh. It was just a few blocks away from the Holt home. Ligon was three miles away. When my grandparents applied to Daniels, a formal procedure for applying for transfers hadn't been developed in Raleigh yet. But by May 14th of the following year, a new statewide pupil assignment procedure was in place. The, the plan was that each local school board in North Carolina would make up its own decision as to how it was going to integrate public schools. And one of the things that any school board could do is to ask people who wanted to integrate to apply. Resistance in Raleigh had shown itself in the application to Daniels. Broughton would be no different. For the Holtz, it was time to take serious legal action. We spent some time trying to find some parent who had the guts and the nerve to be the plaintiff in a case like that. And, and, and it was Joe Holt who agreed that, he, that his son would be the plaintiff and they were the only one we could find. Blacks in Raleigh were afraid at that time. They owed their very existences in terms of their subsistence, their jobs and all that, to white people who were in control and had power. 
Nobody wanted to lose their jobs. Everybody needed to make an income, and everybody was uptight, and people pulled away from us. Some folks who had been friends were afraid now to say, yeah, I know the host, they are friends, but nobody wanted to be friends. We went through a lot. I found out soon that North Carolina, when I went down to Bertie County to represent this black man, I don't think they'd ever seen a black lawyer before in that courtroom. And uh, the trial of the case lasted about two weeks, and each morning I would go there uh, and walk into the courtroom, someone would hold it out, here comes that, here comes that nigger lawyer from Raleigh. And I, of course, I would smile and hold my head up and strut up to the front of the, to the bar and proceed to give him hell. Yes, I remember Mr. Taylor very well. Oh. Everybody knew Mr. Taylor. He was, uh, I, I would say that uh, Lawyer Taylor was like a legend in his own time. He was uh, a very popular lawyer. He was uh, known for his, uh, for his uh, knowledge of the law, his competence, his ability to argue it. He was the man about town, as I understood it then, in terms of, of black lawyers here in Raleigh. The United States Supreme Court handed down the Brown decision in 54. And as was the case in many of the states and areas, the states weren't doing a thing to carry out the United States Supreme Court's edict. And we were, and I had a young lawyer to come work with me from Howard University, Sam Mitchell. He, uh, he heard about the hell I was raising in North Carolina, and he was from Goldsboro, and he said he wanted to come down because his county goals, but Wayne County, one of the worst counties in the state. And he wrote me in his senior year from Howard and asked me if he could come down and work with me, and he did. And at that time, he and I were the only two lawyers doing it, and uh, uh, we knew that the United States Supreme Court had decided to hold case, and, but nothing was being done in Raleigh whatsoever to integrate schools. Herman Taylor knew Raleigh was not going to accept integration as the new order, and the city's resistance had the backing of a larger voice, a more influential voice, a governing voice. Public schools of North Carolina are part and parcel of our state and its great progress. I shall do all I can to preserve them, but let no one be misled as to how I personally feel about mixing the races in the school. I'm unalterably opposed to it, I intend to continue seeing that our state uses every lawful and proper means to prevent it. No, it couldn't happen because uh, when the schools are divided like that, not only were, you, were the schools divided, the power was divided. Whites had the power and they took care of white schools and they gave the black schools what they wanted to give to them, which wasn't as much as white schools. We weren't funded as well. Our facilities were not as good. We had second-hand books. We were inferior facilities. That's what we had. The Advisory Committee on Education, which I appointed, has maintained a full-time staff of lawyers working in close cooperation with the Attorney General, who, with the committee, has examined and considered every possible solution to the school problem, which has been offered in this and other states. In April of 1956, this committee released its findings in a report. It said the decision of the Supreme Court had destroyed the school system's foundation of segregation and thereby had destroyed the schools themselves. Uh, the governor had a special meeting of the legislature and they came up with a plan called the Pearsall Plan because one of the members of the legislature was named Pearsall from Rocky Mount. For Pearsall and his committee, the public schools had to be saved, and the solution rested upon the preservation of a segregated system. The Pearsall plan was the subject of controversy and fierce debate. Governor Hodges called a special session of the legislature late in July of 1956, and in a record-breaking five-day sweep, this plan was introduced, voted on, and passed by the General Assembly. Uh, the Pearsall Plan uh, was designed to uh, say officially that the state was complying with the Brown decision, uh, but then to point out uh, that uh, uh, it was really not necessary for school boards to desegregate, and if they by chance chose to desegregate, 
then the uh, parents had the option to take their children out of school, white parents, to take their children out of school and send them to private schools and get tuition uh, support from the state. So in effect, what the Pearsall Plan did was to say, yes, uh, we will uh, obey the law, uh, but we will provide every means available for citizens uh, not to comply with the law. It's as though they duped the public. This is the only way we can save our school system. Well, what's going to cause us to lose it? Our own attitudes, folks. But no, that, that really wasn't brought out. Our own attitudes. In other words, it was as though they were saying, we all know that most of us white folks in this state do not want integration. And we know that, 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 um, that if we have to abide by this, we will close down the public school system of this state and generate a private school system if we have to in order to avoid compliance with the Supreme Court decision. Well, that means then we won't have any other public school system. But the reason we won't have it is because we aren't going to have our white kids going to school with these black kids. But that really didn't come out that way. It was as though everybody understood that. So they said in order to save the public school system, in other words, you know, to save us from ourselves, because we know what we are liable to do. We, 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 we're, we're going to generate a private school system if we have to. We'll close the public schools down. So what we're going to do is come up with this plan which gives local school boards the decision or the authority to decide how they're going to handle this thing. And it was just a legal maze and something that really need, need, need never have been done. The Holt application for transfer from Ligon to Broughton was in the hands of the Raleigh City School Board. The family had received unwanted media attention since they first made application to Daniels in August of 1956. This is what happened in the Holt case. And this is what the prejudiced white people thought would happen. As soon as a child applied, then your name would hit the headlines in the newspapers, and it would hit the media. So everybody would know who was applying. And a short while after Joe had applied, people began to pass the house there on Oblin Road, throw rocks on the porch, honk the horns in front of the house practically all night. Stop in front of the house and throw flashlights. And while all that was going on, the boy's daddy lost his job. He was a friend and associate of who I was working with. He was a Mr. Finley, that's who he was. He was a man who had to say yes to Mr. Finley, and that was all she wrote. The people I, w I was friendly with uh, uh, didn't hold the, the popular view in, in Raleigh. Uh, in fact, we were neighbors of your grandfather's employer who summarily dismissed your grandfather. M Mr. Finley lived on the corner of where we lived, and we, di we did not socialize at all. But we sure knew when, uh, when your grandfather uh, was let go from his job because he had the the audacity to try to enroll his son in, in the public school, in the, the white public school system of Raleigh. White people would ride by there and say, you black son of a bitch, so and so and so, we're gonna blow your house up. We're gonna dynamite the house. You think you're gonna get in so and so, you think you're gonna get in a white school? If you, I'll die before I'll see you get in one. I'll die before I see you go to my, ever send you that little, little black nigga of yours to white school. We are so accustomed in America to all the, to the sensationalism that is associated with people who fight and maybe eventually win, that maybe people don't think that this kind of thing is worth telling, but it is because it happened to us, and I'll never forget it. It was a cruel thing, and that's just an example of the kind of duress that we uh, were subjugated to. 
I've known of the courage of my grandfather and my father during this trying period because they've told me about it, what they went through, many times. But I never knew the courage of the wife, the mother who endured this for her family. My grandmother died the year I was born. We never met. But one woman knew her very well. Elizabeth Cofield knew the entire family because when she and her husband first moved to Raleigh in 1945, they lived with my grandparents. Elizabeth Cofield was a school teacher, just like my grandmother, and loved her like a sister. Very warm, very understanding, very sensitive. Uh, had to be not only in terms of the fact that she was a principal for a while, but had been a teacher all of the time. Had come from a very fine, disciplined, educationally oriented, culturally uh, centered family. And uh, your grandfather came from the same type a value system, value-oriented family uh, from the far eastern part of North Carolina. Humorous, sensitive, a deep thinker, and loved poetry. And at some times, particularly, he'd want to recite his poetry. And then we would tell him, hold it, Joe. <laughs> we'll hear that another time. But a very deep, philosophical man. We used to say often that they, uh, that little Joe, your father, was spoiled, <laughs> but disciplined, yes, and only child, and uh, well behaved. And there's a difference, as we used to interpret it or define or distinguish between being spoiled and being bad. He wasn't bad; he was spoiled. It was, it was a matter of I have to do this because of little Joe, and I want the best for him, as she had had. Okay. As the 1957-58 school year drew nearer, the school board began to find excuses to put off making a decision on Joseph's application. Its latest plan was to invite my father and his parents to the next meeting for an interview. This idea was proposed by the newest member to the board, J.W. York. J.W. York was very much aware of how powerful he was in the community as a developer and he kind of took over on the school board. He might not have been the head of the Raleigh School Board but he let you know who he was and kind of uh, was very autocratic. In those days they used every ruse they could find to delay and one of the reasons we didn't want your, your, your father and his parents to go to that school board meeting was that we knew that they wanted to get them there and try to intimidate them, browbeat them, see, and put them through all kinds of torture. And as their lawyer, it was our business to shield them from that. On August 6th, 1957, the school board met and denied his application. The general reaction was that we were not uh, in favor of, of integrating Broughton High School at that time. Our feeling was that when we got ready to integrate the schools, that we should start in the primary schools so that the children would grow up being used to the integrated schools and it would cause fewer problems for all concerned. But, but they, he gave you that reason, but they never advanced that reason to us at any time in the whole case. See, they, they never even mentioned that. And if you read the record in the whole case, you'll find no reference to that whatsoever. Before the end of the month, Herman Taylor appeared at a school board meeting and presented the Holtz petition requesting a hearing for the board to review the denied application. About a week later, three members of the board met. J.W. York, Leroy Martin, and Fred Carnage. Only one voted in favor of Joseph Holt. Fred Carnage. Yes, was on the school He was board. a fine citizen. He was on the school board the whole time I was on the school board. Uh, he's a lawyer, a very fine lawyer. And then in my recollection, and you can prove this out in the minutes of the school board, my recollection is that in every integration case, Fred Carnage voted to integrate, and all of the other members uh, voted not to integrate. Once they heard the decision, Taylor and Mitchell took the case directly to the federal level and filed a suit in the U.S. Eastern District Court to get Joseph Holt admitted to Broughton immediately. I tried to go in the state court. I filed it in the state court. 
the Superior Court of Robinson County, but they gave me the runaround for about three years, including all the delays and uh, sanctioned by the judge. So I dropped this suit in the state court and went into federal court. And it, that, that was in Lumberton. That's why when we filed the, this Holt suit here in Raleigh, we went into federal court to begin with because experimenter taught us that we'd be wasting our time to try to get a decision against the state of North Carolina out of a state judge. We knew we'd be wasting our time. Time had already run out. Joseph would enter the 10th grade in just a few days. Meanwhile, the school board had 20 days to respond to the suit. It looked like my father would return to Ligon. The school year passed, and the summer of 1958 arrived. The school board had sought to have the Holtz case against them dismissed back in October, but the judge ruled against them. Later, a new judge was assigned to the case, a jurist from Greensboro. The case would be heard by Judge Edwin Stanley. The court date was set for July 1958. I was a good student, and I just always felt that I wasn't good enough. And I often wished that, gosh, I wish that I was a genius, and then they couldn't find any reason for rejecting me, you know. But as Mr. Mitchell said to me once, he said, it has nothing to do with your academic performance. The reason that you're not going to broaden or that any black child is not allowed to go to broaden is because you are black, and it has nothing to do with your academic prowess one way or the other, don't be concerned about it. But I was very concerned about it because I knew Black Raleigh, if you will, I felt Black Raleigh, if you will, wanted to make sure that anybody we sent there is somebody who's going to really make all of us look real good. So you couldn't have any fault. I felt I needed to be faultless and perfect. And I think that that was my greatest anxiety. Court proceedings lasted two days, yet the case carried into August. Judge Stanley said he'd release his ruling in about two weeks. In September, Judge Stanley released his ruling. He said, in short, that the Holtz had failed to exhaust all administrative remedies under the law, and therefore my father was not entitled to attend the white school. I was surprised when I heard that. It, it, you know, I was startled by it. I, could, I couldn't, it, it didn't connect. It didn't make sense to me based on what I had witnessed in the courtroom, you know. But, and then I had never heard this term administrative remedies before. That's the first time I recall really having heard it was when Judge Stanley made his final ruling and said we had failed to exhaust administrative remedies. I didn't understand what that meant. And when I came to find out what it meant, what it had to do with, my understanding of it was that because we had not gone in person before the school board at this hearing, and we had done that on the advice of, uh, of our lawyers, and because I felt and we felt that they were going to ask us questions uh, that we might not have been able to answer and use that then as a basis for saying, see, that, and they were going to ask me questions. And I was just a young person, and I knew that I would face a hostile white school board of adults, adult, hostile adult whites. And I felt that they could ask me questions uh, that could trip me up, and that would be used against us. And one thing led to another, and, and, and our lawyer said, you don't have to go down there anyway. We can represent you. All they're going to do is try to embarrass you and intimidate you. So they went and represented us as any lawyer can. And they advised the school board that they were doing so. But that was regarded as a failure on our part to exhaust administrative remedies. And they never had any intention of letting me go anyhow. I learned years later, I learned ye years later that the Pearsall plan was in fact, in retrospect, admitted to be unconstitutional and that all it was was dragging, as Lawyer Taylor used to say, a red herring across the trail to raise dust and cloud the issue. But for years, I felt like we hadn't done something and had let the black people of Raleigh down because we hadn't gone down there and that wasn't it at all. It wouldn't have mattered. If Joseph Holt had been at elementary level and had applied at the same time William Campbell applied at an elementary school, uh, he would have been accepted, I would say. Absolutely. It was not a personal matter at all. It was a matter of primary school against upper school being integrated. They had already decided 
that this was the best way to integrate the school system? Well, why were we put through all this and made to feel that you didn't go because of something you didn't do? It was they who didn't do. They didn't comply with the law. But they came up with some other laws that really sought to circumvent and undermine the law of the nation, the law of the land. And then we were held accountable for not complying, uh, for allegedly not complying, with some pseudo technicality, you know. And to this day, people remember and still think that we were the first family, those who were close to my family, and those who, when they see me, you know, then it comes back to them. And many of those people said, you need to tell the story, that you were the first, the first to try. And what you all went through, they will say. Because your daddy lost his job. Your mama almost lost his job. They threw rocks at your house. You got letters from the White Citizens Council. Your lives were threatened. They said they were going to bomb your home. And all this, and y'all didn't have any money, and this and that and the other. And a lot of people know this. And we went through hell. And that story is a story that has not been told. And I feel we've been slighted because of that. I really do. And I think that is an important part of the history of Raleigh that has been overlooked. And it's not to embarrass Raleigh, but don't tell me that it didn't happen by not acknowledging it. It hasn't been acknowledged. It's been just passed over. Someone said to me who went to school with me in elementary school and high school, somebody needs to know that integration in Raleigh did not occur without some people catching hell. And we caught hell. My father was promoted to the 12th grade and returned to Ligon for his senior year. But the lawyers continued to appeal the case to the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia, and all the way to the United States Supreme Court on June 22, 1959. By October of that year, the case of Holt versus the Raleigh City School Board closed. The United States Supreme Court ruled with the lower courts. That spring, Joseph Holt graduated from J.W. Ligon, the all-Negro high school. Although my father never gained admission to Broughton, the integration issue in Raleigh remained alive. The family's move had stirred others to action. Less than a year following the Supreme Court's decision, seven-year-old William Campbell made history as the first black to be admitted to an all-white public school in Raleigh in September 1960. It's been close to 40 years since my father and his family endured their three-year battle against segregation in Raleigh. But despite the city's denial of his rights, my father persevered and succeeded. At St. Augustine's College, he achieved high academic honors and graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Biology in May 1964. He continued his education with graduate studies at the University of Chapel Hill under a scholarship from the Southern Education Foundation. In November 1964, he entered the United States Air Force and in three months won his commission as a second lieutenant at Officer Training School. He married Laverne Lane and earned his wings as a navigator after training at James Connolly Air Force Base in Waco, Texas. In 1965, they became the proud parents of a baby girl and named her Jocelyn. With all this, Raleigh was reminded of Joseph Holt, citing his outstanding airmanship during the Vietnam War. 1966 brought both tragedy and blessing for Joseph Holt. Early that year, his mother passed away. But on the last day of that year, his second daughter, Deborah, was born. In February 1970, he became the father of three children with the addition of his only son named Joseph III. Ten years later, my father was selected to attend the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. At the same time, he pursued a master's degree at Troy State University and graduated from both programs within a year's time. He completed his military career as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force August 30, 1990. My father helped raise three college graduates, all from North Carolina schools. I'm teaching young adults now at a university. I feel that the way in which I make a contribution is by inspiring them and doing whatever I can to enhance their self-esteem and cause them to believe in themselves. 
I sense that so many of them don't feel that achievement is something that is for them, uh, that they're all about. I sense that some of them think that moving into the mainstream is something that is just a dream and for somebody else. I try to convey to them to get rid of the idea, get, uh, get, eliminate the idea that you are tied to mediocrity or that mediocrity is something acceptable. It's a way of strengthening and bolstering the psyche because again, I feel that the greatest damage to the African American has been the damage to the psyche, the damage to the self-esteem. I'm doing what I can in a very small way to overcome that because when you beat that, you can beat everything else. That's my contribution. <laughs> Thank you.